crossed the river to be with the ancestors, we cannot face Ahunuonga and the four others that died during the Komi Preko demonstrations. President Nana Kufuado, you were the spokesperson of the Alliance for Change. Since then, you have become a member of parliament, attorney general and minister of justice, foreign minister, leader of the opposition, and then finally, president of the Republic and commander in chief of the Ghana Armed Forces. Ahunu and others whose lives were cut short in their prime deserve better treatment. Their blood haunts us from the grave. If it is now impossible for whatever reason to bring the murderers of these people to justice, we must at least honor their memory properly. We continue to campaign for things to be named after members of a so-called big six. What about the ordinary people like Ahunu Honga who gave their lives in valiant struggle? A 14 year old killed for nothing. Alas, my senior brother and comrade, Akoto Ampao, only a few days ago crossed the river to be with the ancestors. If it can be said about anyone that he did his bit, then lawyer Akoto Ampao, the man we fondly call Sheshe, is that man. Comrade She, may you finally find rest. But those of your comrades in the AFC who are still alive, I call on all the surviving leaders of the Alliance for Change to push for justice for Ahunu. Kwekubaku Jr., Kwesipra Jr., Charles Reku Brobi, Nyahota Maklo, and Kweku Poku, you are the ones I knew the best. This is a historic duty you must perform before this Robinson Crusoe society collapses into a heap under all the pillaging and takes us all down with it. We must not sit and watch as another June 4th, 1979 situation develops. I sound the warning again. Everyone with breath in their body must take up the issue of political party and political campaign funding. It is the root of all evils. In our stumpy day, poor public sector governance and the attendant absence of security for those who strive for meritocracy. I have spoken publicly at some length about this only in July. Therefore, I do not wish to dwell on it too much today. All I wish to say is that we must change the aspects of our constitution to insulate the appointment process from the manipulating hands of politicians. I have recently made some proposals for changes to the public sector board appointment process. I will just refer to a few of the things I mentioned and then move on. What I do know is that we are faced with a crisis. On some, if not many boards, there are a number of people there who have no clue what they are there to do. To be honest and meticulous in such a climate, you must have the strength of something and more courage than Che Guevara. It is a constant battle for the few that try. I now make these proposals for strengthening public sector governance, which I have repeated before on other platforms. A structural and determined approach must be taken to strengthen state competence. That is specifically in this case, the effectiveness of, of boards of state-owned enterprises. A amend constitution and all other relevant legislation to insulate strategic appointments in the public sector from politics and to give improved security of tenure to board members assuming good performance. Above all, board members need courage and independence to be effective, especially in the public sector. More must be done to make it possible for them to pursue the path of integrity wherever it goes in the discharge of their duties. B, concretely, this should mean a radical departure from the current state of affairs where the president and his people appoint nearly every SOE board that matters. To one where vacancies are advertised publicly, professional search committees are put in place and recruiters are used to interview prospective candidates. The results of such interviews must be made public on demand. For high profile jobs like the Chief Justice, William Utunga wearing an earring would never ever have become Chief Justice of Kenya if we use the sort of process that we use over here. But look at the reforms he led in Kenya. The interview should even be done publicly in the media. These measures will, stop, will help restore the independence of the public sector. There are now too many instances of boards that lose courage because they are where they live and die at the pleasure of their political masters. It leads to a very poor corporate governance outcome. Such appointments should then be solidified with performance-based contracts, spelling out what boards are expected to achieve in granular terms, how long they will exist for, how the boards will be evaluated to establish a look of failure and also hopefully a look of success. These will then become an, an objective and transparent criteria 
by using merit-based tools to recruit, retain, and reward board members for what is an onerous responsibility if it is done well. I'm not talking magic. This is done in Singapore. So everything is not done in this world. It is done there. Rwanda is very close to, to this, if you need an African example. The situation in Ghana since the beginning of the Fourth Republic, Madam Chair, is that as soon as a government changes, all boards of SOEs are also changed. This is deleterious to development progress. Boards grow when they get continuity and deepen sector knowledge and understanding. D, once board appointments are made, there should be world-class continuous professional development for all members of boards, especially the chairpersons. The training must be verifiably world-class quality and designed to constantly upgrade the capabilities of board members. The level of sophistication in knowledge of corporate governance that board chairpersons require in modern times demands investment of time and effort to achieve. E, Public sector boards should be evaluated regularly and results given to regulators. These evaluations should be conducted by independent bodies with clear action plans that are reviewed for compliance by cabinet members responsible for the respective sectors. I know there must be people saying, to them, I respond, we can all pretend that we do not know we are in serious trouble as a country and then go down when the fire next time becomes the fire right here and the bottom of the bucket drops out. Or we can heed the admonishment of Deng Xiaoping. People who want to reform societies must take structural approaches and tackle big issues of the day. In Deng's words, they must dare to touch the backside of the tiger. The rise of anti-intellectualism and the attendant collapse of intellectual rigor in our development discourse. I do not know any society on earth throughout human history that has made it to development without serious thinking, critical reflection, systematic awareness creation, and collective mindset revolution. Not one example exists. We cannot be the only one. It has become fashionable in some places to trash demands for intellectual rigor. Sometimes I watch with horror as statements from different government agents, regardless of which parties in office, contradict each other. Serious societies that have made it from poverty and misery to prosperity and development were led by people like Li Kuan Yu and Deng Xiaoping. They had one thing in common. They recognized the place of thinking in their society and declared knowledge, mindset, science in the broader sense of rigorous study of all fields as the primary productive force. It is, of course, for our leaders to welcome fact-based challenge more and encourage it. It has become perilous to many from a point of view in surviving as a supplier of government in anything to disagree with power. This is not a recipe for constructive development, but the intellectuals and thinkers themselves to have a role. And here I speak to the kinds of people gathered in this room. Throughout human history, people without courage have affected nothing. We too have the responsibility to speak out and participate in the conversation to rescue our beleaguered society. For now, for example, it is now fashionable for these politicians, I use the word in quotes and unquotes, to distract the judiciary after every presidential e election because losers no longer accept results in this country. What is it that politicians do when they are in office? That makes them so suspicious of the electoral process as soon as they are in opposition. Someone must explain to us, all professionals in this country must rise up now to demand that John Dramani Mahama and whoever emerges as the presidential candidate of the MPP, tell us now what they find wrong with the electoral process. If they are that bothered, we the people must know what they know, so we all fix it. We cannot afford this degree of destabilization and upheaval and fear in our society every four years, simply because we want to elect a president. Many of whom anyway, simply promise miracles that have led us nowhere in three decades. Had I my own way, all major presidential candidates that participate in the 2024 elections would be made to sign a death oath in blood that they will accept the outcome of the elections. Every four years since 1992, the bucket of elections has tested the peace of this country severely. If we leave it that way, one day the bottom will drop out, be sure. Democracy and development must mean democracy and development for the masses. We cannot achieve that without peace and harmony and stability. When I see how even intra-party elections 
and contests are now characterized by violence. What has happened to our values and ethics as a people that we tolerate such scoundrel conduct from politicians who want to lead us? Enough, stampede. The uncontrollable rise of factionalism. Only because this subject saddens me deeply, I will be very brief here. All I will say is that no people who remain this divided in all things ever develop. In Ghana, we now put party before being Ghanaian or African. Whichever party is in power excludes the other. All boards, ambassadors, even handlers of public toilets are fired. No continuity, no space for mastery of the craft, just power grab. There is no route to development with this attitude. The 21st century winners will be those who learn to cooperate and collaborate in networks, alliances, and partnerships, even with those perceived to be their enemies by others. It takes an ecosystem to liberate and properly emancipate the productive forces. The perilous Russian roulette of a Santa Claus democracy makes people in office extremely insecure. People who must always look over their shoulders become susceptible to corruption for they always worry what will happen to them if they are sacked. The absence of meritocracy has a corrosive effect on values and ethics. But will the falcon hear the falconer? Or will we wait, as William Butler Yeats pointed out, things fall apart and mere anarchy is loosed upon the earth. In now, stumpy day. Now a message to engineers and all professionals. The Russian sage and writer, Leo Tolstoy once said with characteristically profound simplicity, and I quote him, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself, end of quote. I have spoken on the platform of professionals, specifically of engineers. If you have assumed that I have let off professionals quite, light, quite lightly, then fasten your seatbelts, for we now proceed to the gates of hell. Whatever this country has become, Professionals deserve their equal share of the credit and the blame. We have been part of every government, government since independence. We cannot now extricate ourselves. But I do not intend to sermonize at an individual level, for I believe that we must apply sanctions and the law must work where engineers and indeed all professions are involved. If it has become the case that everywhere professionals have become complicit in subverting the public procurement practices by paying bribes for deals and sustaining a system of political patronage, people must suffer for it. It should not be a matter of discretion to be an ethical or values-led professional. That works for the long-term health of society. Without a healthy and functional society, Professions and professionals do not thrive. Almighty Lord, I can say it no other way. Professional engineers who do sloppy and shoddy jobs and deliberately thereby cause mass injury and fatalities should be jailed and struck off the professional role. The professional associations must have the courage to do this, regardless of who is involved then we will see sanity return to this country. I can tell from the silence that sanity has already started. <laughs> In our lifetimes, we will see that sanity. You cannot take public funds or even private funds to do a job, and then you construct things that ill people or damage the ecological system. I say it again, such professionals should be in jail somewhere. Of course, you as an institution of engineering should be involved in putting together all the professional development schemes, continuous education, competent incentive schemes, mentoring and coaching, proper regulation and standards and so on. If in spite of these, pure greed, for that is what motivates all this, leads people to be willfully negligent, they must be adequately punished to serve as a deterrent. And when the day of judgment comes, we should not start making calls to achieve justice and start saying, you told us you were our friend, so help us, and asking our priests and chiefs and juju men to go and plead. That is the extent of my appeal. Now, stampede. I now have a set of things I suggest the Ghana Institution of Engineering can focus on. I touch on this and then I'm done. The first thing I did when I was giving this subject was to reflect on what our national values are as a people and to ask a few of my friends. 
everyone agreed on freedom and justice, but then everyone had their own candidates for some other values. Freedom and justice are indeed comprehensive values, and any society that really achieves them will become a developed society in the true sense of development and humanity. Going through the national anthem, Ephrem Amuziyar Assassini, and the directive principles of state policy of our constitution, I submit three more. We value solidarity, courage, and integrity. If you put them together, freedom, justice, solidarity, courage, and integrity, you get a humane and disciplined society in which the rule of law is functional and people live in dignity. These values underline the fact that the central task of the 21st century is to emancipate and liberate the productive forces in order to improve livelihoods and achieve shared prosperity and shared dignity for all. This is the surest way to secure the long-term health of our society. Professor Donald Sean, an expert in the area, insightfully poses the right question when he asks in his book, 1991 book, The Reflective Practitioner, and I quote, is professional knowledge adequate to fulfill the espoused purposes of the professionals? Is it sufficient to meet the societal demands which the professions have helped to create? End of quote. As professionals, we must always ask ourselves these questions and answer them honestly. That will help us face what should be say, faced. I suggest for the consideration of the Ghana Institution of Engineering that it picks up these points that I have previously mentioned in an open letter. Five areas that Ghana Institution of Engineering is well-placed to do this in if we have the courage and leadership are A, dealing with poor construction standards and practices that lead to preventable accidents. B, structural solutions to perennial flooding challenges and improving general sanitation, which must mean in our lifetimes that we eliminate open defecation, which is a blight on this country's civilization. C, management of vehicular traffic on our roads to significantly reduce the carnage and improve economic efficiencies of transport by eliminating many deadweight costs in the current system. D, tackling Galamse systematically, organically, holistically, and structurally. E, value chain solutions to systematically de-bottleneck the end-to-end -end agricultural production systems in order to improve food production. I always favor focus and prioritization. In these five areas, I believe we could have more than enough to keep the Ghana Institution of Engineering very busy for the next five to 10 years minimum. Obviously, there will also be in place talent development in the profession. All of these areas will require that engineers stand up and organize. It requires courageous and determined leadership as well. The question for us all is, are we able to provide that leadership for our association? The revolutionary thinker Karl Marx, writing in 1845 is in the, in the 11 Theses on Feuerbach, observed provocatively, as he was quite capable of, and I quote, Philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. End of quote. Those immortal words were inscribed on his tombstone upon his death. Can we change the situation? It is what we do next that will decide. So if it is to be, it is up to you and I. Will we? Now, stampede. Now I close. Now we must close. What happens next is up to us in his extraordinarily influential book, Man's Search for Meaning. Among many other things, the psychiatrist and noisy Holocaust survivor, Professor Viktor Frankl, made these striking comments. I quote him, for the world is in a bad state, but everything will become still worse unless each of us does his best, end of quote. Viktor Frankl then added these immortal words I will never tire of repeating. They are indeed very powerful for reminding people that we can all make a difference with the right attitudes and mindsets. I quote Frankl, we who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked the hearts, comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way, end of quote. We have agency, that is the point of Frankel, even in the middle of this mess, to choose our own way. Which road will we choose? 
the road that liberates the productive forces to improve the livelihoods of all our compatriots, or the neoliberal road that enriches a small elite, corrupts the system to the point of destruction, and leaves our society dripping with mass misery. We each and collectively have a choice to make. It will definitely be worth the time and energy required for each of us to reflect on these words of the incomparable Amilcar Cabral. And I quote, therefore, national liberation takes place when and only when the national The evolution or growth of the liberated people necessarily opens up new prospects for the cultural development of the society in question by returning to that society all its capacity to create progress. Cabral continued, the more one realizes that the chief goal of the liberation movement goes beyond the achievement of political independence to the superior level of complete liberation of the productive forces and the construction of economic, social, and cultural progress of the people, the more evident is the necessity of undertaking a selective analysis of the values of the culture within the framework of the struggle for liberation, end of quote. This is true, not just about independence. It holds validity in the cases of our search for true democracy, good governance, development, indeed everything. The is saying Swahili when they say Uhuru, they mean independence, freedom. And Pio Gama Pinto used to say Uhuru must mean Uhuru for the masses. The day is coming, I hope, if we are willing to dare everything and work hard, when we, like James Baldwin, faced with the hopelessness of the present, shall also be able to say, like Baldwin, the very moment I thought I was lost, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. Before that day arrives, though, I leave you with inspiration of the slogan of the Portuguese-speaking anti-colonial freedom fighters and that of their Cuban comrades. A luta continua hasta la victoria sempa, victoria seta, Africa. Maibuye, thank you for listening and that. We can please take our seats. There's going to be a time for vote of thanks, but before we do that, I want to ask everyone to put their hands together once again for an hour, an hour or so. I know you said you were going to speak for 45 minutes, but um, at a point we were trying to hold up, time is up, but I kept telling Harold, we're so engaged in this conversation. As engineers that were here, we're committed to change. Um, we're all met with systemic issues that sometimes makes it difficult for us to also go through with our endeavors. But it's a promise that we're all taking away from this event today, that as engineers, we should remember that the, the buck stops with us. Um, when he was talking, I kept looking at the front row and I was looking at all the IPPs who have selflessly put themselves on the line to cause change in this institution. And we're riding on the shoulders of all these wonderful people and saying to ourselves as engineers that the time is now for us to ensure that things are done differently. So thank you. I assure you that we've listened to you. We hear you. We understand what we, the situation is on the ground. It may be different when we look at it from the engineering perspective, but it's going to change. And um, for, 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 for the, the more serious issues that we've discussed, we realized that it's going to take a lot of stampede to go through that. So not stampede. Thank, thank you very much, Ami. This is an account really say senior. Thank you very much. Would like to open the floor for questions. I don't know the kind of question you want to ask after this, but the floor is still open for questions. If you have clarifications and we want please um our time is fast spent let's get to the point we've had one speaker already we don't want a second speaker if you have a question ask the question brief and to the point don't give a lecture and don't tell us that you've given us a very brilliant speech and i remember a b c d no 
please straight to the point. Thank you very much. So we'll, we'll come down. I think what we'll do is we'll take about three, three questions, questions and, um, and then we'll, so we'll come down with a microphone. So anyone who has any questions. Indira Basin, please brief and to the point. Having preached for 30 years in Ghana and the US, I've come to realize that our being or the most prominent aspect that we should look at in this country and Africa is the human factor. I repeat it, the human factor. Very often people speak, but nobody is prepared to work at it. I thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Engineer Benson. So that's a contribution. Thank you very much. So the floor is still open. So we have two questions in the back. Um, I'll take those on this side. If there's any questions from this side, you can raise your hand and then I'll walk up to you. I would like you to mention your name. I was going to say where you're calling from, but, <laughs> and then you tell us. Yeah, I'm an uh, engineer Cosmas. I was in of ASO. Um, I like the, the talk very much, and especially um, the, uh, mentioning that systemic problems need to be looked at instead of just individual. One of the issues I'm thinking is uh, if everything can be moved online so that code is law, the code itself can enforce laws. Because when our fathers were managing production with their children, they could see what everybody is doing. Now we are, nobody can, can see what everybody is doing and, and try to coordinate and enforce and so people get away with things. In fact, you will not know a lot of things that are happening. So if um, we can take the vice president's uh, um, digitization seriously, I think it will help. Even money can be, can be uh, in court. So that if, if you don't spend it, let's say in three years, maybe it can expire. And <laughs> yeah. and. Uh, yeah, another thing we have to look at, I mean, the way money is even promoting the inequality. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll finish on yeah, inequality. For example, the, the interest rate that is compounding is, is, is not a fair thing because if I in, earn interest today, it will start earning interest also. A tree has to grow until it's mature before it can give fruit. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Please, let's be brief and to the point. Final one for this round. Do we have a question from this? Okay, there's a gentleman here. This is not a question, but a contribution. Okay. Throughout history throughout many civilizations. Countries became better countries not because of politicians. Looking to break Britain as example, US as example, Singapore. To the point, as Ghanaians, we have to stand for our countries as entrepreneurs, as engineers, we are supposed to stand for our countries, not politicians. So the future of our nations and those who are going to make our nation better is the average Ghanaians, we engineers as Ghanaians, first and foremost, because engineers, we create the future. So once again, I'll say, we should stand for who we are as Ghanaians, our ethics, our, our morals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, because of time, we want to, Okay, I think we have one question in the back. We really want to tackle three questions for our speaker so that we can actually have an engagement from him. Three questions, um, top. Hi, I wanted to ask, my name is Zoe. Please go ahead. I wanted to ask, um, ethics, the foundation of ethics is morality. 
morality is fluid mm. in a lot of times. So when do you draw the line? Especially when the particular scenario in question does not have an exact answer in the code of ethics for GHIE or anything relating to legislation. What do you do then? Thank you. Okay. Good question. That's a valid question. Any other question? So, so far we've had two contributions and two questions. A third question and then we'll close the, the cap on questions. Two and a half contributions, one and a half questions. Okay. Okay, can we also check with our participants online to see if anyone has posted a question? Okay. Okay, my name is Engineer Gidart Kunake. My question is uh, corruptions that have become an established systems. How do we break them so that we can make progress in this country? We don't have any questions online as of okay. now. We'll take our last one before in Engineer Yao in Sako comes on. Okay. Mr. Kakre Samoa. Good evening. Um, I got the impression that our distinguished speaker was not too clear about systems or individuals. So where do we stand? Systems are made of individuals. It is individuals who drive systems. So how do systems work without individual involvement? And how do you change a system without changing the individuals who run the system? Thank you very much. Thank you. So, okay, so I think we can get um, our guest speaker to answer these three questions. Um, do, would you need to recap or you're good to go? Okay. Recap? Okay, so the first question I think someone was asking about digitization, how do we bring everything together in a digital world? I don't know if it's so to speak a question. Um, we then had the lady who asked the question about where do we draw the line in terms of morality versus what we call, consider ethics, because it's very fluid. Sometimes you can't even figure out where we stand. And then we have the last question that I'm sure you're clear on. Okay, having spoken for so long, I'm just going to try to be very brief. Um, as far as I'm concerned on digitization, we should stop the talk and focus on the outcomes. Uh, I'm, I'm not very, I was told one day in a presentation that we had built 400,000 toilets in Ghana. I said, well, I have no way of evaluating it, but the openification number has not gone down. And for me, statistically, it is impossible to have a population of 32 million people put 400,000 toilets in and the openification number stays at 18%. So I hear a lot about digitization. Let's make it impact. Uh, I went, because you heard the Chief Justice say that I recently retired. I went to one office. I would not mention them to embarrass them. They said they had digitized the place. They kept me for 30 minutes entering data. Then when we finished, they said they brought out carbon paper, some pad, et cetera. I said, what is this? It's the parallel process. So if we say we're doing digitization, let's do it well. It has made many major benefits. That's, that's what I will say. The question of uh, gray areas, which is what you are talking about. I have one simple principle. You resolve everything in the interest of the long-term health of society. That has to be the criteria, long-term health of society, not the month's numbers or the quarter's numbers. What is right in the long-term health of society? And then Kakra asked the question, my good friend, uh, which is very Cartesian, <laughs> I thought. <laughs> it's, uh, I said people like the two-by-two two metrics, individual system. The world doesn't work like that. It's, it, I talked about systemic causes. I didn't talk about systems. And I talked about mindset revolution being necessary at the individual level, but you have to tackle the structural issues. And yes, I agree completely with, with Kakra that it's going to be a mix of the two things. But at the end of the day, there is, I've told many people the story. He says I shouldn't mention his name, so I wouldn't mention it. But my former technical director is here. I know as a young engineer that if I went to say to him that I told people to move from a place, they didn't move, so I've put water there. I know what would have happened to me. I'll not be here today. For sure, for sure. So we don't like to have this conversation about the absence of consequences, but no society has ever achieved discipline without also having a law-based society. In fact, at one point, 
Deng Xiaoping came under a lot of pressure in China from Amnesty International and so on and so forth about the death sentence, etc. His response was striking. He said the most powerful deterrent in the world is to see somebody die for crime and that they can do what they want to do in the West. But in China, he knows his people. If he takes that away, he will lose control of crime. I think I've seen it in many places that you've lived in in the world. We talk about Singapore, West Germany, Scandinavia, and so on and so forth. I lived in Lagos with many people from those societies. And you should see how indisciplined they become when the framework of laws is absent. You wonder whether they're the same people. And by the way, you take people from the most rowdy towns in West Africa, put them in Singapore. They shape up. Because you joke, you know what the rattan is? It's the cane. They will cane you publicly. Even Bill Clinton, when he was president of America, tried to intervene for a 12-year-old who went and sprayed cars. Okay. Lee Kuan Yew told you, you do what you want in America. But here, you don't come and fool around. They came the guy. So when you are in Singapore, 3 a.m., we are walking the streets. The light, the light turns red. We all stop. As one of my friends used to say to me, say, rather than come and pay $200 to these Singaporeans, I'll give it to my church in Ghana. They'll turn me into a saint. So that's the way I look at it. Thank you very much. We have a few questions online. David Aboya is asking, how do we use standardized approach to curb ethical issues through bodies like the Ghana Standards Authority? And Francis Kumi says, in Ghana, people say one cannot change the system. How true or false is this? And what practical steps can one really take to change any sinking system in our public sector? I think this has been addressed, but yeah, I think it's already been addressed clearly in the presentation. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's been addressed. So there's nothing really to add. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, so we'll take, so we'll take this as our last, our, last, our last round of questions. Maximum three. Hello, good evening, everyone. Yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, engineer, um, you've mentioned the VRE situation on um, some situations before you finish your lecture, and even after your lecture, you start doing it again. So, um, I'm not trying to say what they did was right, but then since they were told to go, they were they were trying to drive them away, and it didn't work out. What do you think was the alternative situation in such situations? Um, I would like to ask again, in uh, situations when persuasion fails, is force always the next option or there is another option before you can look at force? So I would like to ask those that question. So one no, more so, question from the back and oh, then we are done. One more question from the back and we are done. Go on. Okay, my name is Elvis Ampo. Okay, so... Realistically speaking, if all the measures are put in place to alleviate all this corruption and on ethics, how much improvement would be in the life of the average Ghana in the rural area, realistically speaking? The, the third question is unanswerable. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> when I sit on the right-hand side of God, I'll ask that question. But right now... I right think now, you I are not a prophet. <laughs> yes, right now I can't prophesy. Uh, the question about VRA is a valid question. I have many very good friends. And uh, in fact, the guy who came on TV is a very, very good friend of mine when the same hall when the Chief Justice was actually saying, yes, it's a very valid question. I asked my friend, can you show me a court order that you got when the people refused to, to move? Can you show me the trail that you went to the police, the armed forces to get help? Can you point me to where they were supposed to relocate to? Or you just said relocate, and, and then they should relocate. Now, I don't want to do an inquest on an organization. I don't have all the facts. I use it more as a case study. The, the, the idea, what it, let me ask you the question. If Jubilee House was in Mipe, would we do this? Answer that question for yourself. And I think in that answer, you have the answer. Um, before we, we move, Harold, those of you who asked questions or had comments, if you could kindly raise your hand, we have something to give to everyone who 
contributed to this conversation or asked questions. So the ladies here will bring these book round for, for you. Thank you very much for joining the session. Uh, we've, we've just had an ethical lecture. So uh, we, we've been told those who are supposed to raise their hands. Thank you. Ethically. <laughs> We want to acknowledge the presence of engineer Andrew Quaison, our past president who joined us and uh, engineer Yawen Sarko's former boss. We want to recognize your presence, past president, engineer Quaison. Thank you very much. We would like final, at this point, we'll take the closing remarks of the chief justice and the chair for our ethics lecture today. Let's put our hands together as we invite our chair to give her remarks. I think a fitting way to start these remarks is to ask that we clap again for you. It has really been a stimulating evening. And um, I could um, understand why he likes to describe himself as a freedom fighter. You're bringing it down because I'm shorter than him. Using humor, literature, philosophy, orature, and structured delivery. You have walked us through the granularity of poverty, factionalism, and non-development, not only on our domestic landscape, but on the global stage. You have provoked a review of the causes of the pain of the nation by reviewing systemic, systemic failures in the country. You have identified some causes such as the high cost of our Santa Claus democracy, a democracy that is characterized by the arrival of an occasional visitor with a lot of goods, who brings it out because you come out of your home clapping and cheering because of the arrival. And I, I believe that's one of my takeaways, Santa Claus democracy. You have identified weakness of public governance as one of the causes, the four causes. Another is a loss of meritocracy or a failure to grow meritocracy such that those who can work, work and increase capacity over length of time to ensure that they deliver better. And instead of having a situation where there is a truncating of good work that has been developed from knowledge of a terrain, every four years or every eight years or in the current slogans of breaking the eight or increasing the whatever, whenever there is a change, even the Managers of public toilets change. And I've had that experience. I used to be the external solicitor of a, a municipal assembly. And I was shocked by the attraction of grown men to the management of these facilities. <laughs> you have described for us the loss of intellectual depth in public discourse. And for me, I think that's one of the most refreshing parts of this lecture because the lack of intellectual depth is a really painful scene to watch. You have recommended promotion of freedom, the values of freedom, justice, and solidarity as national values. This evening, Yao in Sarko, you have also identified four 
you have identified a number of factors that your professional group, the Ghana Institution of Engineering, should be looking at strengthening, dealing with poor construction standards, dealing with the poor sanitation practices, management of vehicular traffic, tackling galamse holistically, and tackling weaknesses in agricultural systems. My disappointment this evening as your former teacher has been your failure to identify. Okay, before I, I go to my disappointment, I think I, you've spoken about the power of deterrence and law enforcement in this country. And and I and pointed out how human behavior changes when it knows that what they're doing will be sanctioned and well and truly sanctioned. So to return to what I think is my disappointment, I think in focusing on the neoliberal elite and focusing on the political group that you have fallen into what I think is a trap that this country is falling, fast falling into. Because I recall yellings from VRA concerning the, this water level. However, much of media focus was on political activity. And so even though VRA was drawing attention to what was happening, people could hardly hear. It was like a little child's voice in the, in the house with a bellowing father. The child's voice gets drowned. And so I think that in focusing so much on the, new, on the liberal elite and the political group, you have taken, you have not properly traversed the landscape of how on a daily basis, on a daily basis, the different groups of Ghanaians are choosing to join in the Santa Claus democracy. And the different groups of Ghanaians are not being heard. Because I know that from my little corner, I'm trying to tell everybody that if I, you take the hundreds of thousands of cases filed in the courts, there's a very minuscule number that is related to political issues. And they are not my worry at all. What is my worry is how Ghanaians can buy land and how Ghanaians buy land safely and how the interest rates can come down so that there's fewer debt recovery cases and how judgments can be executed. But those conversations keep getting drowned in the cacophony about polit politics. So perhaps we should also think about how we can take our nation back, the conversation back, from politics, and then perhaps then the Santa Claus may Santa Claus may not be so welcome, and Santa Claus may not be so big. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a good evening. Um, and just when the conversation just got interesting, we have to draw the curtains <laughs> because I think if we stay, there's going to be a lot of conversation. There's opportunity after this for us to socialize and continue the conversation. But for now, um, we want to invite the, okay, so we should go ahead. Vote of thanks. Okay. So for now, I would like to invite engineer Bismarck or to 
to give the vote of thanks, after which we will close today's event. Thank uh, you very much. After which the dignitaries, front, seat, front row, yes. will come forward to take a group picture. Right over here. So, okay. Bisma. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I can hear this is serious. Good evening. Hasta la vista. This is what? Stampede what? Please. I don't know the code. Uh, most importantly, the Chief Justice of this Republic is here. If you try anything stampede, I, mean, I don't want to go to prison. Uh, very so much grateful for your attendance. In fact, we, we are so much amazed. The first time goes to our sovereign creator, Jehovah God, for providing us, all of us, the life that we have and we are enjoying to be here. In fact, without life, we wouldn't be here. The second time goes to our most powerful teacher in this room. You all agree that we have the most powerful woman in this room, in this country to her ladyship. Please. Her ladyship. I've always desired to marry a lady, but to hear her ladyship being given as a title acquired by virtue of one's ability is, is really beyond measure. We, we so much appreciate you, your ladyship, for taking so much out of your time, your busy schedule uh, for being here with us and marking our finest uh, lecturer for tonight. Uh, we have taken cognizance of the marking scheme that you have given us and we'll work on that. We so much appreciate for that. Please, a round of applause for our lady. Second one goes to our the lecture of the moment. I think Ken UST and Legon have so much slot for you to lecture. Uh, along the way, I, I just could think that uh, if he was my lecturer, I probably think I would not catch up with the way he was lecturing. Because the speed, I said, this man is too smart for my liking. Thank you so, yeah, for my liking. <laughs> when you have so much of a smart lawyer, uh, sorry, a smart teacher, you are likely to fail his people. So yeah. Thank you so much, Engineer Yaren Sarko. Please, a round of applause for Engineer Yaren Sarko. Then we come also to, before we come to our Executive Council, our fathers, our past president, uh, for being so much graceful to this event. We so much appreciate you. In our midst, we have our vice past president. We have, our, in fact, we have even the chairman of the Engineering Council. Can you imagine? A very powerful man. He's here with us. Uh, round of applause for him. And uh, we have, uh, uh, I mean, one of the most astute women engineers in this country, uh, engineer Kalim Bushedid. I love her name. Please clap for her. A former vice, a former president of the Ghana Institution of Engineering and also West African Federation of Engineering. Africa. Oh, sorry, madam. Africa. Wow. I think I've, I've switched the position of Engineer Leslie Aye to that of Engineer Kalim Bushedi. In fact, just recently, she was a president of the Federation of African Engineering Organization. Engineer uh, Kalim Bushedi, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we so much appreciate you. We have, uh, I think I've forgotten some of the names, but pardon me, we have our, uh, Engineer Leslie Aye. We have Engineer, please help me out. Atu, Atu Brian. Yes, I've, I've seen him. I've seen him. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we thank we thank you so much for also giving uh, your time to come uh, to attend this program with us. We also thank the Executive Council of the Ghana Institution of Engineering. We thank the President of the Ghana Institution of Engineering for making available your time and that of the Executive Director. We thank that of the chairman of the uh, ethics committee also. And uh, the last one goes to all of us. For those in attendance and for those online, we thank you so much for making 
a piece of your time to being with us today. And then we want to appreciate that next year, by this time, you also make time and attend this program. Until then, what would we say? Hasta la vista, right? Okay. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Oh, thank you very much, Engineer Bismarck. Um, without closing um, on this, I think we, we, we need to acknowledge our sponsors as well. We'd like to thank Tropical Cable, Fabri Metal, and also, um, sorry, Volta Revolta, sorry. Volta Revolta, VRA for, sp I had to look at Joyce's face just because <laughs> she's been fighting very hard in the last few weeks, but thank you also very much for sponsoring today's event gamma sanitation and water project and then joy joy fm joy tv we're live unfortunately they had to cut off for a program at eight o'clock so at that point it went off and for all those who were online at one point we had about 260 people online but on youtube and on facebook we can't tell how many people were watching us exactly but on our zoom page we could tell how many people were over there so for all those who are online would like you to register your attendance because this counts to your continuous professional development. And for those of us who are here who haven't registered, it also counts. So please register. So when you're going for a renewal, it will be taken into consideration. Thank you very much. Okay, um, once we're done, we'll ask our invited guest, uh, past president, and also all the council members to join us at the social center downstairs. And for all of you who are here, we also have a bit of entertainment for you at the, um, at our, what do we call it? At the shed. So we'll all meet at the shed as well. Um, that we would like before the guests go away, we would like for them to come up front so that those of us who are here can take a picture with you and then we would lead you out to the social center. Members, thank you so much for joining us today. We've had an amazing lecture and hopefully when we have another opportunity to meet, we'll get these same numbers again. So thank you and have a good evening. As we are leaving, as we are coming forward, we want to still remember our sponsors, started with Volta River Authority, Gamma Sanitation and Water Project, Taka, Fabri Metal, Tropical Cable, and Joy News. Thank you very much. Without you, this would have been difficult. Please, we want our dignitaries, past presidents, executive director, executive secretary, engineering council, chairman engineering council, please come forward and then we'll take the picture. Council members, 